We are now in the 25th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. And so we encourage you to read it over. And tonight we will be studying the 25th chapter. This morning we'd like to draw your attention to verse 19 of chapter 25. Acts 25, 19. Now, the last verse of chapter 24 tells us that Festus was sent to replace Felix as the governor of Judea. As we had mentioned in the 24th chapter, Felix was a very corrupt man and ultimately had to be replaced as the governor. He was brought back to Rome, would have been sentenced to death, except that Paulus, his brother, interceded with Nero to spare his life. But Festus was sent now to govern over this province, and he went first to Jerusalem to present himself to the leaders of the Jews, to more or less get acquainted and to uh, just meet with them as he was uh, coming to rule over this Roman province. They informed him of this Paul who was still in prison in Caesarea. It shows really how deep-seated their feelings were against Paul. For by this time, you would think that they had forgotten all about him. But they desired that Festus would bring Paul to Jerusalem in order that he might be tried before their tribunal. That was uh, their pretense. In reality, they were planning to ambush Paul on the way to Jerusalem and to kill him. Instead of bringing Paul, Festus suggested that they come on down to Caesarea, which was, of course, the capital of the Roman government in that province, and he said, uh, I will hear the case against him. So they came on down and once again leveled their charges against Paul as they gave their unprovable complaints. And Paul responded by just the denial of all wrongdoing against Caesar or against the law of the Jews. So at this point, Festus asked Paul, if he would be willing to go up to Jerusalem to face these charges. And Paul responded, Caesarium Apello. That is, I appeal to Caesar. Now, every Roman citizen had the right, if he felt that he was being given the runaround, or he was given a poor decision by the court, he had the right to appeal to Caesar as the final authority. He was sort of the supreme court. And it was the right of every Roman citizen to appeal to Caesar. Now, Paul had been for two years a political pawn. He was being held without charges, which was a violation of the Roman law. And uh, Felix, as we said, was very corrupt, and he was wanting Paul to give him a bribe that he might release him. And Paul refused to do so and was just held a prisoner for two years. Paul was sort of fed up with being this political pawn, 
And so when Festus said, Do you, would you go to Jerusalem and face these charges? Paul said, I appeal to Caesar. Caesarea Mapello. And so Festus said, Caesarea uh, Palestai ad Caesarea Ibis. You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. But Festus was now in a bind. There really were no charges made against Paul that were worthy of death, even imprisonment. Festus, as a Roman judge, should have released Paul. It should not have been necessary for Paul to appeal to Caesar. But having appealed to Caesar, Festus now must send him to Caesar. But the problem is, he doesn't have any real legitimate charges. So that when Paul comes before Caesar, without any real criminal charges against him, then Caesar will realize that Festus was not properly exercising Roman justice. And the Romans prided themselves in Roman justice. So he was in a dilemma. He had to send Paul to Caesar, but he also had to send some legitimate charges or else he's going to look bad. So King Agrippa, who was really over the whole territory, came to Caesarea and Festus explained his problem. He said, I have a prisoner here who is sort of a leftover from Felix's uh, rulership and um, the Jews have made some, well, here we are in verse 19, our text. Uh, they, they have made these charges against him, uh, but they didn't bring up, he said, anything that I expected them to. But they only had certain questions against him of their own superstitions and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. So Festus said, this is, you know, they just had a bunch of religious arguments, and it sort of centered around this person, Jesus, who was dead, but Paul was affirming that he was alive. This is the heart of the issue. And it continues to be the heart of the issue to the present day. Is Jesus dead or is he alive? Now, it follows he is either one or the other. There are many people today who believe that Jesus is dead. They do not believe in the story of the resurrection the story of the empty tomb is to them as a fairy tale, or they call it mythology. Those who believe that Jesus is dead are living in a dark and hopeless world. There's really no hope for the present. As we see society crumbling about us, we see the gang warfare, the rise of venereal diseases, the corruption of government. There can be no real hope for legitimate changes that will somehow stop this mad dash to destruction. There's no hope for the future. If Jesus is dead, then that means there is no hope of eternal life. We live like hogs, we die like dogs. Death 
is the final end. And all of those who have died have gone into oblivion. They've perished. Now, the result of hopelessness is despair. And how many people in the world today are living in a state of despair? They keep trying to fill that void deep inside. And they've discovered that money doesn't fill it. Sex doesn't fill it. Drugs do not fill it. Fame hasn't filled it. It appears that today many of them, like Madonna, think that maybe having a baby will fulfill that emptiness within. If Jesus is dead, then there is no real justice in the world because we look at how often good people die at a young age. Good people experience unexplainable suffering. Evil people often live to a ripe old age. We cannot explain why it is that some people are handicapped. Life just isn't fair if Jesus is dead. But Paul affirmed that Jesus was alive. Now, at one time, Paul believed that he was dead. And that is until he met Jesus personally on the road to Damascus. And when you meet someone personally, you talk with them and they talk with you. That certainly convinces you that they are alive. And we see what the change did for Paul, the transformation that it brought in his life. The transformation in the life of Paul cannot be explained apart from Paul's deep-seated belief and conviction that Jesus was alive. He went from being an enemy of Christ to a friend of Christ, from a persecutor of Jesus Christ to one who proclaimed Christ to the world. He went from hating Jesus to loving Jesus, from inflicting suffering upon the believers in Jesus to suffering himself for the cause of Jesus Christ. And when you look at all of the things that Paul suffered because he believed that Jesus was alive, how he endured all these things and even rejoiced in them, you realize that Paul at least was convinced himself beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was alive. Paul writing to the Corinthians of the things that he had suffered for the cause of Christ said of the Jews, five times I was beaten with 40 stripes except one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I spent out in the deep. I was in journeys often in the perils of waters and in the perils of robbers, in the perils of mine own countrymen, in the perils of the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and in nakedness, beside all of those things, 
that come upon me daily the care of all of the churches. No man would have endured all of those things unless he was thoroughly and completely convinced that Jesus was alive. So the whole issue is the resurrection of Jesus. The Jews were saying he was dead. Paul was affirming that he was alive. And this is what the heart of the issue, the crux of the charges against Paul, his belief that Jesus was alive. What are the implications if Jesus is alive? First of all, he is the Son of God, as he claimed to be. The Father did send him into this world to save us from the consequences of our sins. Those who do not believe in Jesus will perish in their sins and face an eternity separated from God. Those who do believe in Jesus will receive the forgiveness of all of their sins that they have ever committed, and they will live eternally with him in the glory of the heavenly kingdom, which is marked by righteousness, peace, and joy. Basically, those who believe that Jesus is alive have a hope for tomorrow and for the future. But there is an anomaly here. There are many who do believe that Jesus is alive, and yet they are dying in their sins. And when they die, Though they believe that Jesus rose from the dead, they will not be saved. They will not spend eternity in heaven. Because there are many people, if you would take a poll and ask them the question, do you believe that Jesus is alive, that he rose from the dead, they would answer yes. I would believe that the vast majority of the people in the United States today would answer yes to that question. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? The vast majority would, would answer the affirmative, yes, I do. But they have not committed their lives to Jesus Christ. It's a very strange and sad anomaly that there are people who believe that Jesus is alive and yet have done nothing about it. As though it didn't matter as long as I believe. You see, one of the worst blasphemies in my estimation is to believe that he is alive and yet to live as though he were dead. And that's the case of many people. Paul's belief that Jesus was alive affected his life tremendously. There are many people who believe that Jesus is alive, but it hasn't affected their lives at all. They are still living after the flesh. They are still living in sinful practices. They are living as though he were dead. They are living as though the commandments of Jesus really don't matter. And in reality, according to the Bible, 
Those who believe that he is alive and yet live as though he were dead are in a worse condition than those who have never heard of Jesus Christ. Peter, in writing his second letter, said, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. You'd be better off if you'd never heard than to hear and do nothing about it. Jesus, in Luke chapter 12, speaks of a wicked servant, a servant of the Lord. But he began to live as though the Lord was out of the picture, not coming back. And he said that servant that knew the Lord's will and prepared not himself neither did according to his will. That is, he wasn't obedient to the Lord. Will be beaten with many stripes. And yet he who knew not, and though he did things that were deserving of many stripes, will be beaten with few. For unto whom much is given, much will be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. To believe that Jesus is alive, and yet not to submit to Jesus as Lord, is one of the worst sins a person can be found guilty of. It moves me, it breaks my heart to realize that there are those here today who have been attending faithfully week after week listening to the Word of God and to realize that they're not saved. They're eternally lost because it hasn't made any changes in their lives. They're still living as though Jesus were dead. They are still dead in their trespasses and in their sins. They live as though the commandments of Jesus are not really applicable to them. They live for the flesh, they're living after the flesh. You see, salvation is more than just believing that Jesus is alive. It's living as though you know he is alive. Living in the power of the risen Christ. Submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ where he is first, foremost, the Lord of your life. So important. So important. Big argument. Jews against Paul. They said Jesus was dead. Paul affirmed that Jesus was alive. And he is either dead or alive. But to say, I believe he's alive, isn't sufficient. It is submitting yourself to live for the living Lord. Shall we pray? Father, help us to realize today that just the affirmation that I believe that Jesus is alive, that he rose from the dead, is not sufficient. That I must live for Jesus Christ, who has risen from the dead. That he needs to be the Lord of my life. 
as I yield and surrender myself to be governed by, ruled by the authority of Jesus. Lord, today I gladly submit myself to the authority of Jesus Christ, asking you, Lord, to rule in my heart and in my life. And I pray, Father, that there will be many who will join with me in this commitment today as we ask you, Lord, believing that you have risen from the dead, we ask you to rule and to reign in our hearts, in our lives. Come, Lord Jesus. Take over. We surrender ourselves to you. Amen. Shall we stand? You know, it is my prayer, my hope, my desire that as I look over the congregation today and I see each one of you, I hope that one day standing around the throne of God as I look over the great multitude, I hope you'll be there. It would break my heart to think that I have spent so many years teaching, ministering the Word of God. And though you may have believed the things I said were true, yet you lived as though they were not. It didn't have any effect upon the way you lived you were still living a life that was dominated by your fleshly desires. Jesus never became Lord. Not just believing he's alive, but living a life that is in harmony with that belief. For if he is alive, then he is the Son of God. And we must submit our lives to him as the Son of God, not only Savior, but Lord. If you haven't really made him the Lord of your life, I would encourage you to do it today. Go back to the prayer room and, and there just kneel before him and say, I want you to take over my life. I want you to transform my life. You see, Paul not only affirmed that Jesus was alive, but the way he lived proved that he believed it. The fact that he made such a radical change proved that Paul believed with all of his heart that Jesus was alive. Not only affirmed it, he lived it. And it's important that we live it rather just than just acknowledge or affirm it. May the Lord be with you and may you live this week in conformity with your belief that Jesus is alive. May you live in fellowship with him. May you walk with him in harmony of purpose and heart. May you live for him.